word has brought shame on 19th century London, which is why unlike other prominent Victorians of the age, Jack the Ripper has never appeared on a banknote. Welcome to Watch Mojo UK, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 funniest Philomena Kunk moments. Why were all the British soldiers in World War I called Tommy? Was that just a coincidence? Before we begin, we publish new content every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. For this list, we'll be looking at the greatest moments from Britain's foremost historical documentarian. Are you Jack the Ripper? Let us know in the comments below. Number 10, Lenin. One Russian who read the book was the man currently starring in this photograph. Vladimir Ilyich John Lennon. It's an easy mistake to make, we suppose, getting the leader of the Russian Revolution confused with the Beatles' John Lennon, though the latter wasn't even born until 16 years after the former's death. Lennon imagined a world with no possessions. I wonder if you can. Nothing to kill or die for. A brotherhood of man. And he chose to bring it about with a violent uprising. We appreciate how far this joke goes, though, with the lyrics of Lennon's first famous solo song, Imagine, working their way into Kunk's monologue. This is the first in many confusions about 20th century Russia, as she goes on to ask historian Ashley Jackson what the Soviet onion is all about. No, it's onion. I saw it on a bit of paper earlier. Credit to him, he goes along with her line of questioning and explains how dependent the Soviets were on hearty vegetables. So how come you know so much about vegetables? Have you got an allotment? Number 9, The Mona Lisa In her look at the Renaissance, Kunk asks the questions we all want to ask, but are too scared to. Her neck's very long. Was she part giraffe, or could he just not do necks? She turns her critical eye on the most famous painting in history, The Mona Lisa and wonders what's actually so good about it. Just looking at her prompts so many questions. Who is she? What's she smiling about? Is she holding a balloon between her knees? And if so, what colour is it? Also under fire is Michelangelo's David, which she studies a replica of, and another Da Vinci masterpiece, The Last Supper. Then there's the realistic veins in the back of his hands carrying statue blood to his fingers. She drives historian Gus Case Lee Hayford almost to madness with her questions about Botticelli too. Art historians must not be used to having to explain why Renaissance masterworks are worth looking at in the first place. Number 8. Medieval Reenactment It's from Robin Hood. <laughs> Threatening revenge on the entire round table for what he did to Gandalf. In an effort to make medieval times more fun and vivid, Kunk is sent by the producers to a castle. She's in an empty grey room, but brings the medieval scene to life with a long monologue and plenty of sound effects laying over the top. There's a big sort of ogre thing watching. Enjoying the sight of that. This scene is nearly four minutes long with no cuts, and we wonder how much star Diane Morgan had to learn and how much of it might have been improvised. They're watching Merlin getting his head chopped off, which rolls all the way across the floor to there, where some wild boar gobble it up. Regardless, it's impressive. Even if her version of medieval Britain is full of ogres and goblins and wizards all fighting each other and eating blackbirds. Life in the castle is back to normal. Just in time for everyone to suddenly drop dead from plague. <laughs> anyway, that's what life was like in my castle. Number seven, nuclear weapons. As part of her study of the Industrial Revolution and later technological warfare, Kunk decides to talk to Ashley Jackson again, this time about nuclear weapons. She talks about how devastating nuclear warfare would be for her ex-boyfriend Sean in particular, but luckily for him, nuclear weapons don't exist anymore. It's comforting, isn't it, to realise we don't have nuclear weapons these days? Well, it depends on who you mean by we. Except Philomena quickly discovers that they do, and she reacts very strongly. These are fully capable missile systems with nuclear warheads. Many other states have them. I'm afraid that nuclear war and the threat of nuclear destruction remains very much with us. We can only imagine how Jackson must have felt to accidentally reduce her to tears, and the episode quickly ends after a brief debate about what the best ABBA song is. Right, can we talk about something a bit more cheerful? Anything you like. <laughs> Do you like ABBA? I love ABBA. Yeah. 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 Number six, promotional material. This is the city of Chichen Itza, built by the Mayan people in what is now Mexico. One of the distant countries Kunk got sent to to decipher the entire history of planet Earth was Mexico, 
where she visited ancient monuments in Tulum via the medium of stock footage. That's where I'm staying, at the five-star Casa de Lujo Hotel and Spa. And then the segment quickly gave way to a sponsored slot for a promotional material, advertising how much fun a mini-break to Tulum is. All the rooms are en suite, and with this stunning ocean view, it's hard to think of a reason to get out of bed. It's true, a holiday to Tulum would probably be amazing. And if you're into history, you'd get to visit all of those ruins. With sunshine all day and partying all night, you won't want to go home. The idea of Charlie Brooker to insert this faux ad for a resort was definitely a stroke of genius, though he has plenty of those. Number 5. World War I you can't talk about the 20th century without touching on the First World War, one of the most devastating conflicts in world history. But Kunk has a few questions about World War I and why it was called that. Why did they call World War I World War I? It's quite a pessimistic numbering, isn't it? Or did they just know it was the start of a franchise? She also tries her hand at unravelling the myriad causes behind the First World War, like the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. His assassination triggered a series of other killings. Soon it caught on and everyone wanted to be killed. It was a bigger craze than fidget spinners. Then we turn to trench warfare, the reason the war was so horrific, as she tries to understand the efficacy of using a seashell as a weapon or what no man's land was. What happened in Norman's land? Were only people that were called Norman allowed in there? Number four, Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper was one of the most anti-social murderers Britain has ever seen. The UK's most infamous serial killer, there's an entire field of study dedicated to Jack the Ripper, Ripperology. Philomena Kunk tried her hand at Ripperology in Kunk on Britain, as she toured London to teach us all about the Queen Victorians. We don't know who he was or why he did it. We don't even know if Jack the Ripper was his real name, or just a nickname like 50 Cent. But she draws some shocking conclusions about Jack the Ripper as she walks through Whitechapel, which, horrifyingly, still exists today. Jack the Ripper murdered at least six women in 1888, and as Philomena rightly says, was never caught. It's chilling to think that Jack the Ripper could still be alive today. Perhaps one day we'll invent a time machine to find out who he was once and for all. Maybe he's one of your friends or neighbours. Or maybe he's you. You'd have no way of knowing. And that's terrifying. Number three, women's rights. Back before she was headlining her own shows, Kunk was a regular on Charlie Brooker's Weekly Wipe, and he sent her off to get to the bottom of what feminism is. If it wasn't for the suffragettes, I probably wouldn't be standing here now. I'd be in a kitchen where I belong. She traces the movement to its roots, the suffragettes, and Wax is lyrical about the differences between men and women, as well as the suffragettes' activism. They did this partly to highlight how unfair it was that women didn't have a vote, but horses did. And also because being women, they really liked ponies. It's remarkable that the suffragettes fought, and some died, for women's right to vote. And now we have Philomena Kunk able to exercise that right and influence democracy. Thank God she's not a real person. Men in vans still whistle at women in the street, though thanks to feminism, the man in the van might be a woman, and the woman they're whistling at might be a prime minister. Number two, Elvis. You can't talk about the 20th century without talking about the explosion of popular music that happened in the 50s and 60s, and Kunk talks to a historian to get the facts on Elvis Presley. Why was it so dangerous to show Elvis from the waist down? Was he naked underneath, like a pervert on a Zoom call? First, she's confused about where rock and roll originally came from, and then she moves the conversation onto Elvis's dancing, which was famously controversial at the time with his wild hip movements. People were prudish back then, weren't they? If they saw his penis, they'd probably have a stroke, wouldn't they? However, things take a serious turn when Kunk opines about the tragedies that could have happened had people been allowed to witness Elvis in all his glory. That's not a joke. <laughs> What's funny about that? If they saw his penis, they'd have a stroke. That's no laughing matter. We're talking about people's lives here. Number one, the moon. Why did the Russians launch Spunk into orbit? Well, first of all, when you're looking at Russian words, the, the name of the world's first satellites was Sputnik 1. Sometimes Kunk wades out of her historical home and asks big questions of expert scientists, including this man, Professor Arnu Oja, 
a foremost physicist in the UK. He was launched on, on a flight that was pretty much one way. There's a dead dog in space. As well as grilling him over the history of the space race and the tragic death of Laika, the first dog in space, she also turns her sights on the moon landing. Kunk wants to know whether there's any truth to the conspiracy that the moon landing is fake. A lot of people on the internet say the moon landings were faked. How right are they? They are completely wrong. She goes on to demand that he present her with proper evidence that the moon is even in the sky at all. I don't know if you've done your own research, but my mate Paul sent me a video that exposes the whole thing. Can you prove the moon exists? You, you can't, can you? Do you agree with our pigs? Check out this other recent clip from Watch Mojo UK and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.